Let's do a little history lesson of the Canon cameras, specifically Canon hybrids. Now, understand, I am primarily focused on video, but I really enjoy photography as well, but my main passion and career is video-centric. So hybrids have always filled a really nice spot for me throughout my career, and being kind of a perfect go-to camera for both achieving great video in many cases, as well as being able to supplement and complement with photography. So I do come at this from that approach. I'm not purely a photographer or purely a filmmaker. I really am the kind of user I imagine who would benefit the most from hybrid style cameras. And what's great about what Canon has done since the very beginning is they kind of kicked this whole thing off. So I think that's what we should do. We should start at the beginning. Let's take a look at the 5D Mark II. I'm sure you're very familiar with the 5D Mark II. This camera was everything they say it is to this day. I mean, it's held in such high regard because of what it brought to the table. Now, the 5D Mark II was announced in 2008. So right at this time, before this, you have to understand there wasn't shallow depth of field video really in, in any meaningful way for someone who could shoot affordably. Sure, there were high-end digital cinema cameras at this time, but these were extremely out of reach for most independent filmmakers and independent content creators, videographers, etc. So with the 5D Mark II implementing live view for photographers where you can like look at the screen and kind of see the live feed of what's happening, that technology was easily translated into recording video. Again, before this, if you had a DSLR, you were looking through the viewfinder. Most point and shoot cameras had the technology to where you could look at the LCD and you could frame a shot. And at the time, there were a lot of people who were uncomfortable transitioning from point and shoots to DSLRs because they weren't used to looking through a viewfinder. You look through an optical viewfinder, you don't see exposure, you are just kind of judging like what, based on your settings, what the shot is gonna look like. And this can frustrate some beginner photographers and it really made that gap between amateur and professional really wide. Well, implementing live view where you can see your exposure right on the LCD screen is fantastic and it's kind of a, a kind of cheating is you know how it's, how it's viewed in, in some cases. But implementing live view for photography allowed Canon to record video, 1080p video, which also at this time back in 2008, HD, was just starting to become kind of this prominent thing where people knew they wanted it, they knew they needed it, you could broadcast in HD, but doing it was very, very expensive. The 5D Mark II changed all of that. You could now get shallow depth of field because before you were dealing with third inch sensors and to go to full frame uh, for video was just insane, the difference and jump from third inch camcorders to something like the 5D Mark II. You've got better low light shooting because it's a full frame sensor, you can do higher ISOs. You could record to cheap media, uh, compact flash, like it, it was relatively affordable or a lot of the stuff beforehand was proprietary uh, media and you just had this explosion of creation from the 5D Mark II. Plenty of people have talked about the 5D Mark II and just how much it changed things at the time. And, and it really was um, the start of the DSLR revolution for all intents and purposes. Uh, everyone loved this camera and couldn't wait to have it. And then things started to trickle out into the other Canon products. I'm not gonna get into the 7D and the 60D and some of their other uh, alternates. I'm gonna try and stick with kind of the main flagship cameras throughout this to just talk from start to finish to see how things progressed and why I think from my perspective, Canon kind of dropped the ball and failed at what they started. So the 5D Mark II starts things in 2008 and is an incredible camera, but it had its flaws. At launch, it didn't record 24 frames a second. It was just 30p. And so as a filmmaking tool, people wanted that 24p for the true film look. It was later implemented with a firmware update, but there was some aliasing and moray with the 5D Mark II. And it just, it wasn't quite perfect because it was kind of this add-on and not truly intending to be this video camera, but a a lot of people ended up buying the camera for that purpose, as well as photography, starting that kind of hybrid shooter mentality where you didn't have to have two cameras, you could do everything all in one. Well, years later, in 2012, Canon releases the 5D Mark III, or at least announced it in on March 2nd. The DP review only has the announcement dates up here at the top. You can look at the reviews when those came out to kind of get a better uh, estimate of when it was actually released, and I'm sure you can find that somewhere, but 
for these purposes, I think the announcements make a lot of sense as we talk about this. So they announce it in March of 2012. And when it finally comes out, it was an improvement on the Mark II, but the Mark III was still 1080p. It still didn't do high frame rate HD. And it was just kind of fixing some of those bugs and quirks of the aliasing array. But you, you notice that like, the 1080p wasn't actually 1080p. I did the, a video on this years ago because I shot with the 5D Mark II and then the Mark III and then we'll get to the Mark IV. But the Mark III records 1080, but there's a difference between recording res resolution and true detail resolution. Just because it's a 1920 by 1080 video doesn't mean you have all the detail possible in a 1080p video. You can do this very easily by just taking a high res photo and scaling it down to 1080p and then comparing it to what that looks like 1080p from the 5D Mark III. I, I guarantee you, you will be disappointed with the 1080p quality you can get from the Mark III. So kind of disappointing, a little underwhelming. It worked for most people as far as meeting their needs and fixing some of the bugs from the 5D Mark II in terms of video functions, but it also didn't introduce anything new to the table. And I think there's a reason for that, that you can look at, because again, this was 2012. Well, in late 2011, Canon announces Cinema EOS, or Cinema EOS, however you like to say it. And this was the pivot. When you go all the way back to the 5D Mark II in 2008, Canon unleashed Pandora's box. They didn't know what they had done, and now to save themselves for their high-end cameras, they, from my perspective, neglected the Mark III and did the bare minimum and opted instead to introduce us to Cinema EOS, which a lot of people like. This is the C300, the C500, the C100, and then all the Mark variations after, uh, after which, which, which they're good cameras. They're great cameras in many cases, but they're definitely in a separate league compared to hybrid style shooting, and they are significantly more expensive. So all the people who bought the 5D Mark II and then were maybe disappointed by what the Mark III offered were now set up for a system where they would have to spend significantly more money to get what they were starting to desire because we're four years now after the 2008 uh, 5D Mark II and time is quickly moving on and people are desperate for higher end video features, true 1080p, better codecs, just better video functionality. Is it, you know, Canon's obligation to put it in their photography cameras? No, they don't have to. But I think people felt a little betrayed that their enthusiasm for what made the 5D Mark II so successful was then translated into higher end cameras that were much more expensive and just out of reach for a lot of people. Well, time moves on. And of course we have the 5D Mark IV. At this point in 2016, Canon was looking a little weak by not having 4K on the, these type of cameras. So they introduced it with the 5D Mark IV. But again, a poor implementation of 4K. This was a really inefficient codec, huge file sizes, and it was a crop of the sensor. I also shot with the 5D Mark IV. It's not a fun camera to shoot 4K with because it's inconvenient and you have a full frame camera, probably because you want your images to have full frame field of view. So to have a crop mode for 4K was also underwhelming and disappointing. And this seems to be the track record for Canon that they keep doing these kinds of moves for the sake of protecting their high-end line or they just don't have the technical expertise to do it. I don't know the reasons behind the scenes, but again, I would say a slight disappointment. And also at this time, you have it being still a DSLR, meaning there's a mirror box inside while most the rest of the industry is going towards mirrorless and Canon has yet to catch up with their flagship models. So 2016, they're kind of dropping the ball a little bit, falling behind the curve, and in a lot of ways delivering stuff that isn't quite what people want, or it is what they say they want, but the execution is handled poorly. So I would say the 5D Mark IV although highly regarded for the photography capabilities, again, neglected in terms of video as something that should and could be a great hybrid camera. Then of course, Canon goes mirrorless, a full frame with the EOS R, which was announced in 2018, two years later. And the EOS R is, as we've come to expect from Canon, a little bit underwhelming in the video department. It does 4K, but 
it's only 30 frames a second or 24. It doesn't really do some of the high frame rate stuff that in 2018 was starting to become more and more common on cameras of this caliber. And although it does a lot of great things, it doesn't do anything significant to separate itself. You have the people who love Canon, you love their lenses, and they're happy with it. But for the rest of people who are still waiting for that 5D Mark II, you know, that feeling, that energy, they released the EOS R and it, it isn't quite there. And I think you'll understand why I say that when we go to what's next, which is the R5, which is the newly announced new flagship from Canon that was rumored to have some of the best, most amazing video features you could ever dream up on a hybrid camera. Announced July 2020 officially, rumored before that, this signaled in a lot of ways for people who are following the news, heralding back to the 5D Mark II, something that would be a game changer, that would introduce 8K RAW, that would allow you to shoot 4K 120 without a crop, internal stabilization, some of the best autofocus in the industry. And 2020 could have been the year that Canon won from my perspective. They could have had all in one. You'll have a lot of people who say the R5 is great for photography, and this is true. I haven't used it myself, but most of the tests I see online looks pretty incredible. The tracking and autofocus and just all around uh, 45 megapixels as a, as a photography camera is incredible. The RF lenses are fantastic. And so when you look at it from a photography perspective, I think most photographers are very happy with it. But Canon did themselves a disservice by starting the whole DSLR revolution and then not living up to their reputation and introducing a whole separate line for their cinema stuff. And with the R5 highlighting and touting those video capabilities, the 8K RAW, the 4K 120, now that it comes out that these modes are compromised by overheating and really to use the camera for video, you can shoot 4K 30 or 4K 24, kind of what we're all used to. And do the images look good? Yes, they do. Do you have some nice features there where you can use autofocus and stabilization? Yes, you do. But what was supposed to be a game changer is just another average mediocre video hybrid. And not even that, maybe even underwhelming considering how bad some of these overheating problems are and the, the recovery times on the camera are just kind of unacceptable, I would say, in that regard. So you'll have photographers who say that it's a photography camera. If you want a video camera, buy a real video camera. But I think this is a disservice to all the people who got into this or were inspired by the 5D Mark II and the possibilities that were unlocked for a, a huge portion of the market that didn't have access to anything like this at the time. If you were there, you know what it was like. If you're newer or you weren't paying attention, the 5D Mark II was a revolution. It changed everything. And for Canon to be resting for so long and then to say the R5 is coming it does everything you want because, again, the EOS R was fine, it was acceptable, but it wasn't what people were necessarily clamoring for. It's just finally Canon is going mirrorless with their full frame cameras, thank goodness. You see their promise of the R5 and what it could have been and now what it actually is. And that's why I say Canon fails as a hybrid system. They have so much name recognition, so much clout, so much nostalgia behind them that people would bend over backward, you know, to buy this R5 if it lived up to the hype, if it did everything they said. And I think really, if they had just lived up to the promises, they would have undoubtedly the best camera out on the market. It would be a no brainer for anyone and the R6 for that matter. You have an R5 for if people who want to spend a little bit more money, get some of the higher end features and an R6 that can do not as much, but almost all the same things for a cheaper price point for the people who maybe are more budget conscious. It would have been hands down, game changing revolution. People would have flocked to the EOS R system. As is, I think they'll keep a lot of the people that are there but I don't think it's gonna win over many of the Sony people. I don't think it's gonna win over many of the Panasonic people. And that's why I think they fail. Is it a technical limitation on their part? Do they just not have the technology or the capability or the intelligence? That's possible. I don't know. I can't read into behind the scenes of what's going on at Canon, 
but I know that for their aspirations for the R5, they've severely missed the mark in actual execution. And will they be able to fix it in a future camera? Maybe, but if time has told us anything over the past, if you go all the way back 12 years ago to the 5D Mark II, the progression has not been in Canon's favor as far as hybrids go. Again, photography, yes, they're fantastic. They're incredible cameras. There's Canon shooters and there will be lifelong Canon shooters. However, the 5D Mark II was something special and they have no obligation to maintain that, but it is disappointing time and time again when it doesn't live up to the initial expectation. And then especially when they say it's going to, they make promises about AK RAW and 4K 120 and they can't deliver something that actually works in a way that's practical. Yes, the camera technically can do it, but with the overheating issues being so frequent, so common, such an issue on any kind of production, it's just not practical. So the feature might as well not even exist. Is this the nature of hybrids in general? Are they just doomed to be bad video cameras? No, I don't think so. There's plenty of hybrids out there, full frame included, that are wonderful video tools that Canon could have easily capitalized on that market and captured both the photographers, the videographers who are looking for something like this. And I honestly don't think it would cannibalize their cinema EOS line all that much because those cameras are meant for a different type of shooter who want a different style camera body, who want other features, more pro features built into the body, such as XLR, ND filters, a lot more buttons and, and flexibility in terms of using it on set. The R5 would have, could have, should have been a true perfect hybrid for everybody, and yet Canon continues to fail.